our array, it's going to cost us $105,000 as a premium on our project in order to be net zero. Never mind, there's not enough real estate. So that's a lot of PV. It's not practical. So there's your incentives. So our goal is to take this pie, shrink it down, doing various strategies, to something that we can actually manage when we start to offset that with PV in terms of the annual energy demand versus what we produce. So load reduction, these are the big categories of it. And HVAC is the same as envelope in a sense because you can reduce your HVAC that way. So, it's, so if you think about energy in a gross way, it's what plugs into the wall, you know, what illuminates the space, and then all, all of my stuff, essentially over here. And so if you're going to look at load reduction, you're looking at the big chunks of those, and you're going after strategies in each of these to reduce your loads. So if you're looking at lights, for instance, uh, you might, or excuse me, if you're looking at plug loads, for instance, you might use more efficient appliances, uh, make occupants aware of the fact that they're leaving stuff on and maybe turn it off more, uh, have an unoccupied mode shut down or a power management of a PC is kind of jumping ahead. And, and so you've got these other strategies, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, I just want you to be aware that this is sort of the approach you would take. So when you're doing energy modeling for a net zero energy building or high performance building, um, I like to say you have to have something called a living energy model on the project. You need some to do modeling early on to figure out where you stand, what goals are possible, but you're going to have to check into that model along the way. But if you have what's called a shoebox at the very beginning, it doesn't have to be very detailed. You don't have to have a detailed design from the architect of the whole building. You maybe just need a rectangle like the size of this building and to know it and know it gets tossed into it. And you can start doing some rapid investigations early on. So I Quest is one they, they know about. Yep. Models like that. It doesn't have to be too sophisticated early on. And you do these shoebox analyses, you do some very rapid investigation of what moves the needle, you know, what helps the most. And that's where you can figure out like a diminishing point of return on your insulation. You know, when you get to the point where, hey, why do I want a 24-inch wall when I, I'm already there with you know an R20 wall, whatever it happens to be. So this is what we did for Z Home. So we modeled there's the it's 10, 10 townhouses. I should have said that, it's in a one, two, and three bedroom. So we had to create a model for a one, and two, and a three bedroom townhouse to do these sort of early investigations to find out what was going to be important and what wasn't. The other thing that's good about a shoebox model is, again, it helps you give a grounding on whether what your goals are make any sense at all. Keep me trying to There's going to be a test for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so this is a, this is a plan view of the Z Home project. And so these are two one bedroom units here, and this is south. So we've got the south is from the bottom. Uh, here are four three-bedroom units. And then these are all two-bedroom units, and this is a two-bedroom unit. So I'm going to ask you another question. I only modeled, we only modeled one one-bedroom unit, one two-bedroom unit, and one three-bedroom unit. So which ones would you recommend I model? I was going to model. So if these are the two-bedroom units, and this is a two-bedroom unit. Which of those should I be modeling? If I'm only going to model one and then say the other ones are good, if I model that one, in terms of looking at, thinking about the climate, thinking about the sun. Anyone want to venture a guess? This is a little subtle, but I'm going to give you guys a chance. If, 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 I'm going to ask Dave next. Yeah, you can ask me out there. What do you think? The middle? This one? OK. What do you think? Uh, unit, unit six and like unit three. Okay. Or are those both two? Those bedrooms? are both two bedrooms. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, but yeah, maybe one that's furthest from southern exposure. I like that. Okay, you're you're pretty close. I won't make you guess. Um, you're you're right on that. I, I we modeled unit six, and the reason was less access to the sun for sort of passive solar gain, and also it's got more perimeter walls. Like unit five only has two perimeter walls, so you've got more perimeter walls where you could actually have heat loss out of it. So we said, all right, if we model unit six and we find ourselves in pretty good shape there, then we're probably going to be fine with these other ones as well. So that was the philosophy. So uh, these bedrooms, the three bedrooms didn't matter as much because they all sort of had the same amount of perimeter space. We modeled unit seven because a west spun sun provides a little bit more gain typically than, a, than an east spun sun. So for no, I think maybe we actually did this one because it had either east first. Okay, that's the idea. I forget now. All right. By the way, does anyone know what a wound earth is? It's a wound earth. Like a living street. Yeah, very good. It's a street that's a, it's a, it's a, it allows traffic by vehicle, but it's sort of trying to downplay that and make it more of a walking environment and a nice environment. Yeah. All 
All right, so envelope. Um, thermal envelope is important if you're going to do a low energy project in, C in Seattle. We are a heating dominated climate, even though, well, it certainly feels like it today, but you know, we don't do a lot of cooling here. Um, some climates are more about cooling, and that's maybe drive design a different way. Uh, but if you start to really do a high performance building, you start to think about the envelope a little bit differently. You certainly want to look at insulation and grading. What do you guys notice about this building in terms of the two exposures? Of the building. One's got shade, the other is yeah. just blank. Yeah. yeah, they're different. And so if you're, this is actually where you actually start to design by orientation sometimes. So this is a south facing, I should ask you that too, south facing. And the reason it's south facing, or you can kind of guess that, is it's got horizontal shades like this, and we have that south facing sun, so when the sun's high in the sky in summer, those shades are do a very effective job of keeping the sun out when you don't want it. And then the sun's low in the winter, you maybe want some of that sun coming in that allow that to come in. So this is a west facing, and it looks like it doesn't have shades. It actually does, but you can't tell it from this photo. I didn't bring it. It's got some exterior sun shades that are sitting out from the, that are sort of like sunglasses sitting out from the window. And the purpose of those was to uh, knock out the hot, hottest sun in the summertime from getting into the space, which you'd have to do for cooling. So you start to look at the envelope, you might look at it differently for different exposures. We didn't do that for Z-Home, that was, but, but you would do this for a commercial building project. And, and some of the ones we've done, literally every exposure has something different going on. So what helps and what hurts? Uh, you said, somebody said something that didn't make a lot of difference. Was insulation, was that what you said? Someone said that there was something you looked at and didn't well, make we, it. We tried to do different envelope changes. We changed the windows, we added the windows. And we added some all that stuff. Yeah. Windows, the shade really Okay. okay. Yeah, well, actually, actually, actually shade, yeah. shades around here some help really the most the way shades help around here is reduce the need for peak cooling on those hot days because the sun's the big killer around here because we don't have hot and humid climate. But it doesn't have a lot to do with the actual energy use of the building because we are heating dominated. So actually if you have shades and you could actually increase the amount of heating you have to do because you lose a little passive gain. So it's kind of interesting. This is from a study done by the New Buildings Institute. I love this study. I've got a I, I, I referred to that. I don't know if you guys actually checked it out. You've seen this slide before? Yeah. Uh, I have. Uh, and I gave it to them. It's not necessarily it's the right answer for all the type of building awesome. types. I think it's just one type of building type. But they did some studies yeah. using EQuest, I think it was, yeah. and wanted to figure out what moves the needle relative to sort of a baseline of zero, which is code. And so if you go green, you're doing better on your other team. If you go orange, you're doing a little bit worse. So this kind of a study helps you understand what's important. So here, you can do a lot better with better insulation. Uh, orientation, maybe not so much from the energy standpoint, it's more of a cooling thing. Uh, glazing area, if you have more glazing than code allows, it's gonna hurt you because we're a heating dominated climate and you're gonna have to do more heating because that's not as well insulated as your walls. And so starting to have a sense of what helps and what hurts is really helpful when you're starting to go after strategy. So what's the most effective strategy to use you know, I, sometimes um, I've done a couple 100% passively cooled and naturally ventilated buildings here in Seattle. I've done more than a couple, actually. And I've done them because of the architect, and I'll, have, I'll show you a quick example one later, really was interested in doing that on their project. They wanted to maximize natural light. They wanted to have fresh air coming through the windows. Did a beautiful project with them. You know, from an energy standpoint, from a heating standpoint, didn't do a whole lot for them. In fact, we had so much perimeter, we probably have to do a little more heating because we're trying to get all that exterior skin available for fresh air to come through and for natural light to come into it. So it, it's not always easy and obvious. Uh, orientation, we did a project, and this is, I'm not gonna talk about this project, but the project happens to be shaped a little like a horseshoe. We call it an oxbow. And we did studies as we rotated the building around to find out what, what it did in terms of energy. So this is actually, these are little energy pie charts or bar charts showing what happened if you move the building and rotate it around. So if you want to look at your envelope and your orientation and get really sophisticated, you can start doing these kinds of things. And, and maybe you're having a new like, rotations. I don't know if you are at all for yourself. We did last, when we did the COVID one, we, we checked out yeah. the different uh, regions of the UI and up being pretty profitable. So, yeah, so there are times when you can, there's times when you place into your benefit in, in certain climate zones to have different orientations. We were down in, um, the Phoenix area, where they do get a little bit of cooler weather, but it's mostly hot weather, uh, having south-facing windows with good shading to keep that hot sun out, but be able to take all the sun they have, which is us, 
in the wintertime for passive solar heating, you know, that's a real time to see benefit on that. Here, you know, we, if we orient the building east-west, or excuse me, so that the, 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 the building's east-west, so most of the side of the building's on the east or the west side, the real problem for us with that is controlling that direct solar gain into the space, which means you have to put in bigger ducts to make the cooling you need to offset all that. If you want to waste your time to play. Uh, so I'm not going to talk a lot about insulation. I'm just going to give you the idea that you want a lot of it. And you want to find the point of diminishing returns. Has anyone heard of passive house? Um, so this is actually some, some photos from some passive house work that was going on in Europe. Uh, but basically, it's a passive house, just as a digression, is a, is a, I guess it's a standard and you get certified as a passive house if you follow the prescriptive requirements, which start with saying you get this much heat for your home versus what you normally need is this much heat. And so if that's your allowance for that you can have for the equipment in your house, how do you make your house comfortable? Well, you insulate the heck out of it, you do all kinds of things. Uh, it's a really interesting way you should look it up if you're interested to find out about passive house. If you guys are ever interested in building your own home or something, you might look at that. Uh, so good insulation, you notice the details here uh, are meant to do something. They're meant to avoid having what's called a thermal bridge. Now, you guys heard of that term before, thermal bridging. And so if you, let's say, have a balcony that's got a part of a continuous floor slab that sticks outside, uh, you all of a sudden have a path for heat, heat loss right there at that point. And uh, so versus the building wall. So if you have a very high R value of the building wall, a very good insulation of the building wall, but you have a bunch of protrusions, it doesn't work real well. So I love this example. This is a building in Chicago. Um, why can't I see the bottom of it? I'm getting cut off here. It's the Aqua Building in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, got finished by Studio Gang Architects in 2009. You can see this kind of a living, it almost looks like it's flowing water. That's why it's called Aqua. Uh, these are all balconies that are sticking out of the side of it. Um, so I think of a thin, thin tube radiator when I see this because it's basically a big radiator in terms of the heat losses. So it's not exactly, and in Chicago it's even colder than here, as you know. So it's a cool looking building, but maybe not the best building. Uh, but it gives a good analogy for, for what I think about it. So if you look at, now another thing besides good insulation is the amount of glazing that you have. So glazing is, you know, we love glazing. Architects love glazing, but we, we all respond to it because it gives us a connection to outside, right? It gives us natural light, we get to see, you know, wh where we came from. It gives us the opportunity to have operable windows. And so I'm all about having glazing, but you, I'm not saying take it out. There's reasons why you wouldn't, but, you know, but it doesn't have much R value. It's hard to find really high performance glazing. And so if you look at, Window versus on, window versus the overall envelope size. And you say windows are none of the envelope size, and you have an R20 wall, you get an R20 building. Because you start to add glazing, and let's just say it's kind of you know, glazing, the amount of R value drops rapidly. So if you get to just say 40% glazing, which is still allowed by code, uh, your overall effective R value might be more like an R5.6 in your building. So you can see it drops off quite rapidly. And of course, if you, if you have it all glazed inside, you don't really get much of anything except for you know, 2.7, which is what the window is. Uh, there are some better window technologies out there, but you have to start looking abroad for the really good ones, and they get pricey on the right. So when I talk about envelope optimization, I use this image a lot. Um, this is a study down in Long Beach, California. So Long Beach is not a heat dominated climate. It's a cooley dominated climate. And so we looked at uh, window to wall ratio. So again, how much percent glazing on the exterior of the building? You know, 20 up to 100%. And this is zone operating cost for the section we looked at, and it's, which is just energy use, basically, the energy cost. So you can see as you increase the amount of glazing, your heating doesn't go up much because there's not much heating you're doing down there. Your lighting energy, assuming you have lighting controls, can go down because you're getting that natural light. I mean, we have a relatively well-lit space with lights off right now. And so, and, but you're going to reach a point, about 40% in this case, where you don't really get a lot more benefit from the standpoint of reduction of use of artificial lights by having more glazing. Cooling is going to keep going up as you add glazing, as fans are, because they kind of go together. So what you're trying to design for, if you think about totaling all these up, is that point. You know, you're looking for your minimum, essentially. And so that's the way, that's one way to think about it. You start to think about it on the in terms of optimizing is where's that point. Now that's optimization from an engineer's point of view. The architect may have different opinions. So that's where you get into that integrated process, right? We're pushing for, we're pushing to this to this place and, and they're responding to it in the design process with ideas that may provide different compromises. They may want to give you a, a better glazing 
for sh exterior shading or some various features of how they approach their design, and you can help them with that if you're an engineer, to kind of try to get to that point uh, and reach a happy place in between what maybe they're interested in or the owner's interested in and, and this stuff. That relates to the 90.140% number that they right. have. So they know about the fact that you legally can do more than that if you do the performance half and all that. Um, so you've got heat gains and losses through the skin through just sort of conductive heat transfer. You've got that, more of it at the last. And then you have infiltration. And this is the hardest thing to sort of put, plug a number for if you're doing an analysis is how airtight is that building going to actually be? How much uncontrolled infiltration are you going to get the cracks and seams in the building uh, induced by wind? Uh, and wind pressures as well as just naturally. And so there's things you can do. I'm not going to talk a lot about infiltration. I don't know if that's the subject you talk about. But, um, Our buildings are all pressurized. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got that. Sorry. But, but a tight building doesn't require as much pressurization air to depressurize. So a continuous air barrier is something you can specify for your perimeter of the skin. The details, where things come together, where you have different materials coming together, those details, architectural details, can be a source of infiltration, so you really have to look at those carefully. Um, they're now requiring, uh, in Seattle, I think it's the Washington Code too as well, but I know it's in Seattle, lower door testing, where you actually prove out how, how tight your building actually is relative to your goals. Now, you had to do that for a while, but now it's in commercial buildings as well. And so you actually have to prove it. So I kind of like that. It's actually making people pay attention to this stuff. Just why do they break up the buildings and doing Yeah, it's, it's figuring out how to do a lower door test for a big building is, is an art itself. You're right, so you have to figure out ways to do that. So here's the best load reduction strategy, in my opinion. Um, it doesn't usually play, but I like to bring this up to people. And actually, I actually I, I run into this, though I don't get successful in it. I do a, I actually do a number of, uh, one of the kinds of projects I work on are actually high-end residences. And I'm talking high-end residences. Ones that are the people that have these homes are recession proof, so during the recession they were a good place to find business for me. Uh, so they would, but they would call us in because they wanted to build this beautiful home or a beautiful vacation home. They wanted it to be more sustainable, but they wanted it to be 10,000 square feet. Well, I have an idea. <laughs> so um, not very successful, but uh, I had to be a little careful saying that. There's a strategy. So a smaller building, that's just inherently, I mean, for net zero purposes, it gets you closer there because you're going to inherently probably use less energy. Now, if you cram all the same stuff in the house, you might not do as well as you think. And if you start looking at EUI as your metric, just KV to use per square foot, and say, gosh, my 10,000 square foot building has an EUI of 20, my home, my 10,000 square foot home has an EUI of 20, and your 15 square foot, 100 square foot house has an EUI of 60, I'm a better building. Well. Not in terms of actual energy use, you just get the idea. So for sea home, a lot of you know we did this modeling. A lot of what we did was having to document our assumptions, and it became important as you think about it because we're starting an early design. Eventually, it's going to get to a contractor, and the contractor may or may not want to use the stuff you specify. You may want to specify alternate stuff, you, and, and in which case you're going to track that and see if it has an impact on performance. But keeping track of all these things really became a big spreadsheet exercise, believe it or not, as simple as that. And so here we're keeping track of envelope assumptions, yeah. what are the wall ratios. So we have this big spreadsheet going. All right, passive strategies. Sometimes it gets a little blurred in my mind what's a load reduction strategy versus a passive strategy, but there are, there are things about that. This, this would be the idea of what can you do to enhance the natural light that comes into your space without hurting it. So how do you enhance the daylighting in your space? Uh, can you take advantage of natural ventilation? That'd be a passive strategy. So, so looking at those kinds of things and seeing how you can take advantage of them. Or if you're down south where you do have that southern sun in the winter time that can provide passive heating benefits, you know, maybe that's, that's another passive strategy. So, so look at the passive strategy. So again, we're still not into the moving parts. We don't have the efficient systems yet. We're still trying to figure out how to do things without getting to that place. So I'm not going to make you swift read all this stuff, but if you want to do a climate analysis, you want to understand how many hours a year you have at certain temperatures. If you're in a humid climate, you want to know when it's humid, when it's not humid. You might want to know which way the wind's coming from so you can take advantage of it, how intense it is at different times of the year. I 
know if you're going to scare them with psychedelic like charts in this course or not. You might learn about those. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if you start looking at occupied hours of the day, you know, 24 hours of the day, 24 years of the year, and I know you can't read this very well, you can start to figure out are there times of the year where I can sort of just run free, where I don't really need any systems because I've got enough hours where I can turn things off because it's the nighttime or during the day when I can sort of have a flywheel effect uh, without having to turn on my systems, perhaps. So, like, if you had a if you had a parking garage and you wanted to live there, uh, at night when it's cool outside, the concrete's going to cool down, right? And so during the daytime on a hot day, if you walk from the second level of that parking garage over there, it's not going to feel anything as warm as it does out there. And that's because you've got this cold mass creating a flywheel and radiating or absorbing the heat from your body. So you can start to think about those kind of strategies. It's kind of interesting. You can add mass to a building. You can start to leverage that perhaps to reduce your peak lows and to perhaps reduce the amount of time you have to operate a flip so, okay. so Seattle, or this area, this is hours and this is temperatures. So if you look at the, the range of temperatures we get and the hours per year we get them in an annual year, you can see we have very few hours, sometimes none, up in these high temperatures. I mean, we usually get that one hot spell, but I don't think it's even last year we got any. Um, but in Seattle, it's a little warmer out here. But in Seattle, it stays cool most of the time. So we're, you know, we're trying to keep our space in, in the mid 70s, maybe. If that's comfortable for you. Uh, most of the hours of the year, the temperatures are below that. So you know, natural ventilation might be a good climate for them. You can do it properly and not penalize yourself in the process. So this is the question you're asking yourself if you're an engineer: Is it, is it natural, or is it mechanical, or is it maybe both? And if it's natural, then you really have to start thinking about the building form differently and, and lots of things a lot differently. And I like to remind people about the idea of comfort and what that means in this space. So I'm going to look around the room, and I see you got a short sleeve blouse on. And I see you have got a jacket on. Everyone's got a different perception of comfort in this space. And so even if I do the best job possible and I say, 72 degrees all the time. Some people are going to be comfortable, some people are not going to be comfortable. One thing we have going for us is that people generally wear more clothes in the wintertime and less clothes in the summertime. So engineers can get away with, at least nutritionally, having a warmer set point in the summertime where people are still comfortable, maybe 76, 78 degrees, and a lower one in the wintertime, 70, maybe 68. And people wear different clothing, plus they adapt to the time of year that they're in. So you sort of get used to it. So if you go, if you, if us Seattle folks go down to hi, go down to Phoenix in the summertime, or let's say Georgia in the summertime.